as the chairman, as the head of the VATAT, uh, the committee for uh, planning and uh, funding. Uh, Chaim is also a Krov Mishpacha, it's a family member of uh, Yuval. And Chaim was, I think, also among the first group of young uh, Israeli physicists that Yuval took when he came back. They were still serving in the army, took them together and put them together to work besides other things, also on elementary particle physics in something which was called Fatha which has nothing to do with Fatah. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess that Chaim will talk uh, on it perhaps uh, this uh, evening. So I will call upon uh, Chaim to talk about neutrino physics, the art of learning a great deal by observing nothing, close to string. <laughs> It's, it's a great pleasure to dedicate this lecture to my cousin, teacher, co-author, colleague, friend, I dare say, and many other attributes, Yuval. Uh, I will have another opportunity later in the day or in the evening to say some more about the incredible number of junctures in which our lives have met. And I think there could be no better contradiction to the previous talk than my talk, which is dealing almost only with experimental search and experimental results. However, like in string theory, almost all of them are null. And yet we learn, like in string theory, a tremendous amount from them. And I find this story of neutrinos one of the most amazing and exciting topics in all of physics. It's probably the topic in particle physics which unifies more than anything else particle physics, astrophysics, cosmology, and nuclear physics. And uh, as you will see, it has a past, an amazing past, a very interesting present, and certainly a very exciting future. So as I've said, uh, this talk is, of course, on this occasion, dedicated to Yuval. A few months ago, with this amazing regularity, which is not very pleasant, and which repeats itself every year. A few months ago, I had a birthday. And I received from my son a birthday card which said, Mazal Tov for arriving to the respectable age of one million, base two. <laughs> and uh, I therefore want to congratulate Yuval on reaching the age of 120, base eight and to wish you, Yuval, Adma Vesrim, base 10. Instead of moving in the years, move in the base. It's easier. It's only have to move from 8 to 10. And uh, I think everybody in the room joins me in uh, our warmest wishes. Move from base 8 to base 10. It's a short hop, and it will be very fruitful. Going to neutrino physics. The beginning was beta decay, 1895. An atom emits an electron and becomes another atom. <laughs> Soon after, it's not the atom, it's the nucleus, but it is the one place in the atom where there are no electrons which emit the electron. This, we are so used to this fact that we never pay attention to it. Here is the atom, it's full of electrons, there's only one place without electron, and it is that place which emits the electron of the beta decay. And then, of course, Suddenly, energy is missing, momentum is missing, something terrible is happening. And then Wolfgang Pauli, like a good Austrian, preferring to go to a ball instead of going to a physics conference, but sending a letter to the physics conference, the famous letter starting with the word, Dear Radioactive Ladies and Gentlemen, of course written in German, but precisely starting with this, a conference on radioactivity. He was sorry he had to attend a ball and to dance instead. 
And in that letter, he proposed that the missing energy is the neutrino. Brilliant theoretical deduction, not the slightest hint of experiment. And then, of course, a few years later, it's not the atom which emits the electron. It's also not the nucleus anymore that emits the electron. It's a nucleon inside the nucleus with the discovery of the neutron by Chadwick. And then, another few decades later, following the remarkable work of Yuval, the discovery that the protons and the neutrons are containing quarks. And beta decay at the end is not the atom and not the nucleus and not the nucleon, but a quark, the D quark, emitting an electron and neutrino and becoming the U quark. So that's, it was in two minutes, the history of four levels of physics. And we do believe that the electron and the neutrino are definitely at the level of the D quark and the U quark. Whether this at the end will be strings or will, whether there will be another layer, we don't know. But we believe that D quarks, U quarks, electrons, and neutrinos are at the same level, as we will discuss in a little while. Now, of course, the result of all of this story is the existence of an elusive neutrino yet to be discovered in our short history, which has no electric charge, no strong nuclear forces. It has a spin one half, simply because otherwise spin would not be conserved by all of these processes. It has only weak interactions. And most important, it has either a very, very small mass by any standard, or an exactly zero mass, originally believed to have a zero mass. And I would say only in the last 30 years, the suspicion started to grow that it has a small but non-vanishing mass. And we will discuss this a great, day, a great deal in our discussion. And just to conclude what you might call the popular part of the introduction, it is so elusive that if 10 to the 16 neutrinos from somewhere arrive at Earth and go through the entire Earth from one side to the other, only one of them will hit something somewhere during the passage through the Earth. And of course, we will have no way of knowing it. On the other hand, if we will have a detector of about 1,000 tons of water, which is the size of an Olympic swimming pool, 1,000 tons of water, which is about 50 meter, let's say, by 10 meter by 2 meter, that's approximately an Olympic swimming pool. And if we would wire this in such a way with, with photoelectric tube or whatever, that every neutrino that hits something will be observed, it will take from the Big Bang until today, it will take from the Big Bang until today to have one event if 10 to the 16 neutrinos per second go through the swimming pool. So I will repeat. We have this swimming pool which is wired in such a way that we can see every neutrino that hits something. We have 10 to the 16 neutrinos arriving every second since the Big Bang. The swimming pool is there since the Big Bang, very practical, realistic situation. We will have one event since the Big Bang at a rate of 10 to the 16 neutrino per second. And that is why Pauli, who didn't know all of these facts, said, I have done a terrible thing. Namely, I've invented a theory which will never be tested, like string theory. <laughs> Now, the trouble with it is that this elusive particle, of course, is very, very important in the reason why we are here. Because it is converting a neutron into a proton, a proton into a neutron. It can hit a neutron and make it into a proton. It can hit a proton and make it into a neutron. And therefore, it is the only way to convert a proton into a neutron or vice versa. There is no other way, which means that any such conversion requires neutrinos. And that means that the creation of the heavy elements, the creation of the stars, and therefore the energy of the stars and the energy of the sun, and of course also exploding stars like supernova, could not have happened if we didn't have this neutrino, which is very instrumental in converting protons into neutrons and vice versa. So it is very likely that everything would remain hydrogen 
if there would be no neutrino, no neutrinos in the universe. Now, neutrino also, once we go to the quark level, is the only neutral particle in the world, except for photons and such, except for the carriers of forces. None of the quarks is neutral, electrically neutral. None of the charged lepton is electrically neutral. The only particle, or the only piece of matter as opposed to gauge boson, which is neutral, is the neutrino. And therefore, it is the only one for which we should ask the question whether the neutrino is the same or is not the same as the anti-neutrino. And as you will see, this question is one of the crucial issues that will come during the discussion. So here, I will only say two statements. The neutrino is much lighter than anything else, or perhaps zero mass, and the neutrino is the only neutral particle. Whether these two facts are related to each other is one of the most interesting and important questions. If we then think about the sun, it was Hans Bethe who recently passed away, who discovered in the 30s the secret of the sun, and the main sequence which is responsible to the energy of the sun, as we know, is basically when you sum, sum up several processes which are happening in a sequence, the conversion of four individual protons, which means four hydrogen nuclei, into one alpha particle, which means one helium nucleus, plus two positrons, plus two neutrinos, plus energy, and that's how the energy of the sun, or much of it, is created. But this is also how neutrinos are created in the sun. And then there are many other processes which we will not get into, and each one of them has a different energy spectrum and a different neutrino flux. They are all creating neutrinos, they are all contributing to the energy of the sun, and it doesn't matter at this point how much each one of them contrib uh, contributes, it matters a great deal to the experiment and to the theory, but to the concept it doesn't matter. What Hans Bethe has found was one process, there are other processes, but they are all processes in which, at the end of the day, protons and neutrons are converted to each other with the emissions of neutrino. And therefore, there's a very intimate connection between the amount of energy which the sun is producing and the number of neutrinos and the spectrum of energy of the neutrinos which are produced by the sun. Hence, you already know, before you even detect your, the first neutrino, that neutrinos are a Detecting neutrinos would be a good way to understand what's going on in the sun. And finally, in 1957, the neutrino was finally observed in the historic experiment of Rhinus and Cohen. And the experiment was done, this was the first time an experiment of neutrinos was done next to a nuclear reactor, where there is an enormous flux of neutrons and therefore an enormous flux of neutrinos, or rather anti-neutrinos usually. And what they have detected is an anti-neutrino hitting a proton and becoming a positron. Now, I want to spend a minute about this experiment, not because of the detailed design of the experiment, which incidentally is a fascinating story, and even more fascinating are the failed experiment that they were planning and they were attempting, but we will not get into it now. I would like to spend a moment, because this is the first, obviously, the first neutrino experiment, because it's the first time that neutrinos were observed. And the difficulties of these experiments were the ones that will haunt all other neutrino experiments forever, including in the future, absolutely guaranteed. It's extremely difficult to detect a neutrino. It's rare, difficult, nerve-wracking, slow, but all of this is child's play relative to making sure that what you have detected is not background. In other words, the big difficulty in all of these experiments is, first of all, to eliminate any other source that will imitate the signature of the neutrino, but more important, to be able to ascertain that the event that you have seen is not something else. And if you think about the history of the Nobel Prize and you ask yourself how come, as we will see in a few minutes, 
the discoverers of the second neutrino got the Nobel Prize almost 10 years before the discoverer of the first neutrino, which is undoubtedly a, a more monumental discovery? The answer is very clearly that the original experiment of the first neutrino, the historic Reines and Korn experiment, was not really believed by many people. And in retrospect, it's clear that it was a correct experiment and it was excellent experiment by the standards of those days. But many people didn't believe it. They believed that the neutrino exists as they did 30 years before that. But they were not sure. They believed that what was seen could have been a neutrino, but they did not believe that one could eliminate other possibilities for this event. And this whole story is a fascinating story. But in any case, in historic retrospect, I don't think there's any doubt that the neutrino was found at that time. Now, we leave, with your permission, the neutrinos for about three minutes and go in a completely different direction in order to return to, return to the neutrinos in a big way soon. I'll tell you a fairy tale. Once upon a time, Theories predicted a new meson which has a certain mass which they could predict. And then soon after a particle was found and it had the right mass, which looked like a verification of the prediction. And then a second particle, almost the same mass, very slightly heavier, was also found. So there was one predicted and two found. And then it turned out that it is the second particle which is the one that was predicted. And the first particle was totally unrelated to it. And then it turned out that the first particle, which was totally unrelated, was not at all a meson. It was a heavy lepton, something that didn't figure at all in the discussion of the people who made the prediction. And this heavy lepton is identical to the electron in all its properties, except it's much heavier. So this is a fairy tale. And I'm sure everybody here is thinking that they know what, which, which, which story it is. And some of you realize, well, this is, of course, the story of Yukawa, who predicted the pi meson with a mass of 100 MeV. And then Anderson and Edermeyer found a particle with 100 MeV. And then a second one was soon after found during the war, during World War II by Powell. And then the second one turned out to be the pion, and the first one was the muon. And the muon is about 200 times heavier than the electron. But exactly the same thing happened in 1975. Glasho, Iliopoulos, and Mayani predicted a new meson, the Chan meson, at about 2,000 GeV. Martin Pell found soon after a particle at about 1,800 MeV. A year later, another particle, slightly heavier, was found by the slack lbl collaboration. The second particle turned out to be the predicted D meson. The first particle turned out to be an unexplained heavy lepton. The tau, precisely the same story, exactly unexplained in the same way, and creating the three leptons that we know and love, the electron, the muon, and the tau. And perhaps the number one puzzle that nobody has ever contributed one word towards solving is the question why nature repeats itself three times in such a crazy, unexplained, unpredicted way with such huge mass ratio, with such numbers which look like they are taken from the lottery and which nobody has ever understood and nobody ever came close to really understanding. And that, of course, immediately, now back to the neutrino, led to the question of are there more neutrinos as well? And the neutrino that came from the decay of the pi, is it the same neutrino that comes in better decay or not? And the answer, soon after the PhD work of Yuval and related to it, was that there is a second neutrino, and that the neutrino associated with the muon is different than the neutrino associated with the electron. Now, the relation to the work on SU3 was that at the time that Yuval was doing his PhD thesis, there were three leptons. There was the electron, there was the muon, and there was the neutrino. 
And there were also three species, so to speak, of hadrons, which the word hadron did not exist at that time during his PhD. And this is the proton, the neutron, and, for instance, the lambda particles, strange particles, which today we would refer to as the up quark, the down quark, and the strange quark. And it was at that time that that triality led to SU3. But it was a year later, after the historic work on SU3, but two years before the discovery of the omega minus, that Schwartz, Lederman, and Steinberger proved that there are two kinds of neutrinos, thereby having broken this bizarre symmetry that there are three species of quarks, shall we say, and three species of leptons, and there were all of a sudden four species of leptons and only three species of quarks. And as you will see, this immediately led to something else. So here we are, going back to neutrinos. We have two types of neutrino, totally unexplained, same as the two unexplained leptons. We have the mu neutrino and the electron neutrino, and it's not clear at all in what they differ, especially if they are both massless. They only differ by the fact that one of them always is the partner of the muon and the other is always the partner of the electron. But other than that, it's totally incomprehensible. In a way, also like the neutrino and the antineutrino, which if massless, and it's not clear what's the difference between them. So we are slowly developing this zoo of <coughs> neutrinos which seem, seem to be indistinguishable. So here we have, for the first time, this map that we will repeatedly see. And we have the two quarks, up and down, from which basically all of us and everything is made. And you have an energy scale at the bottom, starting on the far left with a microelectron volt through milli-electron volt. And please notice, little m is milli, and capital M is a million or mega. Milli electron volt, then you have electron volt, kilo electron volt, mega electron volt, etc. And you have the up and down quark and the electron, you know their masses. And then you have the electron neutrino somewhere out far on the left. And where you see it is just arbitrary, there's a question mark because we don't know its mass. And below you have the historic situation prior to the muon and prior to strange particles. Up and down quarks. Neutrino and electron. Now, the moment the three versus three symmetry that existed at the time of Yuval thesis was broken, and there were four leptons but only three quarks, it was first Bjorken and Glasho and Hara in Japan, and then Glasho Iliopoulos Mayani in a much more profound way, who said there's also a fourth quark. And as we know today, not only it exists, but we have the masses. And you see on this scale that the green particles, the charm, strange, and mu, are two or three orders of magnitude above the red ones. And the mu neutrino is as much a question mark as the others. And of course, another number of years, and we have the third generation, the standard model of today, with the top and bottom, and the tau, and the tau neutrino, which was only discovered a year or two ago uh, in exactly the experiment where it was not supposed to have been discovered, but it doesn't matter if it was discovered and it has the right properties. So now all of these 12 particles have, have been discovered. All of these masses continue to form a, a list of winning numbers in a lottery. It is as random. It's completely doesn't make any sense to anybody. And the only missing information in this table are the three neutrinos, which we still did not know. Now, to confuse the issue, as you would imagine, since there is no logical difference between the up and charm and top quarks, and there is no difference between the down and strange and bottom, these are just three replicas of the same thing, it is not clear what labels them? So one possible label is the mass. If one has a mass of so-and-so, another has a mass of so-and-so, these are mass eigenstates, and they have well-defined masses, so this is one possible label. 
The second label is, if you wish, the family label or the doublet label or the weak interaction label, namely, who is the quark that is related by weak interactions to the up? Who is the one that is related to the charm? And who is the one related to top? And when you ask this question, you also have a well-defined answer. But it's not clear at all that this well-defined answer and the well-defined answer of the masses are the same well-defined answer. And therefore, it is not clear that these six quarks can be arranged so neatly in these three pairs as I wrote it here, up and down, charm and strange, top and bottom. Because if I arrange them by the doublets of the weak force, it is one story. And if I arrange them by their masses, it's another story. And therefore, in principle, there could be a transformation between one definition and the other definition. And that transformation involves mixings of these states. And therefore, we have additional parameters, which are the famous mixing angles of the quark sector. There are three such angles and a phase. <coughs> Now, we know experimentally these angles. They are also not very well explained by anybody. But we do know that all of them are small. All of them are small, which means that to a certain approximation, the mass eigenstates of the quark sectors are not very far away from the weak interaction eigenstates of the quark sector. In other words, the doublets that you see on the screen are approximately making sense. The mixing that I talked about exists, but it exists with relatively small percentages. The partner of the up quark is indeed the down quark with a little bit of mixture of the others, and so on and so forth. And I'm emphasizing this because it will, you will see that in the neutrino sector, the situation is very different. So the fundamental numbers of the standard model, which are totally unexplained, are the mass of the up, the mass of the down, the mass of the strange, of the charm, of the top, of the bottom, three angles, one phase. There are 10 parameters in the quark sector. There are also the mass of the electron, the mass of the muon, and the mass of the tau. So that's already 13 parameters. There are a few other parameters, namely the coupling constant. And depending how you count, you can get anything between 15 and 20 parameters before you said the word neutrino. And now, if all the neutrinos are massless, this is the end of the list. But we do not know that they are massless. In fact, we know the contrary. So now we start the real saga of the neutrino properties. Is the neutrino massless, or is it very, very light, but not exactly massless? And the easiest way to do it is to simply do a direct experiment. The word direct experiment sounds very simple. It's, these are very complicated, sophisticated experiments. But they are done in a small room. They don't require a huge uh, uh, accelerator. And what you do is you go back to the original process that discovered the neutrino, namely beta decay. You look at the missing energy, and you repeatedly look at how small you can get the missing energy. And the smaller you get it, the less remains for the neutrino. And the less remains from the neutrino, the less could be the mass of the neutrino. This is oversimplifying, but this is basically the idea. This is a direct experiment. And with this experiment, we know that the mass of the electron neutrino is a couple of less than a couple of EV. Here it's written less than 10, in, 10 EV. This is not the best number. This has not been the best number when, when this slide was written, which is a year ago or half a year ago. But it, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's, the numbers are of the order of a couple of electron volt. We cannot get it below one electron volt. And it's not likely in the near future that it's going to go well below that. And we already know from other sources, as you will see, that it is way below it. So therefore, these direct experiments are not really solving the problem for us. 
But now a word of theory, and this is not really deep theory, this is very superficial theory, but to my mind very convincing. Nobody has ever given a good reason why the neutrino should be exactly massless. On the contrary, for a neutrino to be exactly massless, there has, there has to be some symmetry principle. Nothing in physics is exactly zero without a reason. It's not that it could be anything and it happens to be zero. That's almost a religious belief for physicists that this cannot happen. And there is no good theoretical reason why the neutrino should have a zero mass. On the other hand, given that the neutrino is the only neutral particle, as I indicated earlier, it's the only neutral fundamental building block of nature, and it's the only particle that could mix with its own antiparticle, because there is no fundamental difference between the neutrino and the antineutrino, there is a very simple argument called the CISO mechanism, which is telling us that neutrinos should be much, much lighter than anything else. And uh, basically the, the mechanism is the following. When you create the mass of the neutrino, you can create the mass in the same way that you create it for any other particle, like the electron or the muon or the quarks. But you can also create an extra element of mass by mixing a neutrino and an antineutrino. So that if there would be only one kind of neutrino, forget for a moment that there is mu neutrino and tau neutrino, if there would be only one kind of neutrino in the world, its mass would still require a 2 by 2 matrix. And the 2 by 2 matrix would have the form in which there is, in the upper left corner, probably a zero, because there is no real mechanism that could give that number. In the lower right corner, there is a very large number which represents the hypothetical level in which of, of energy in which some future new physics can happen, whatever it is. Some unification scale, some new theory scale, some new structure scale, something. So this capital lambda, which is in the lower right-hand corner of the matrix, is an unknown number, but it represents a high energy level in which some future theory beyond our standard model will exist. And the two little m in the matrix, in the upper right and in the lower left, are the normal masses like anybody else, like the electron, like the muon, like, like anybody else. And when you diagonalize such a matrix in order to find the two eigenvalue, you find that one of them has to be of the order of this large number lambda, which you don't know, but which in any case is a very large number and you are not yet able to produce such particles. And the other is of the order of a normal mass squared divided by this number, which means that it is smaller by a great deal than a normal mass. It's a normal mass little m times the small ratio m divided by lambda. And this is why it's called a CISO mechanism, because if you look at the CISO below, the heavier lambda, the lighter the neutrino, and the lighter lambda, the heavier the neutrino. And on a logarithmic scale, they have precisely this linear connection. In other words, if the lambda is x time lighter, the neutrino is x time heavier, and vice versa. You can see this on an energy scale of the world. On the right you have energies. You have at the bottom, minus 9 is a nano-electron volt, then you have a micro-electron volt. Every line is three orders of magnitude. We are scanning here a huge number of, a, a huge spectrum of energy. The, the blue mark starts with nano-electron volt, and it goes all the way to 10 to the 15 electron volt, which is PEV. And that includes all the physics that we know how to do experimentally. Now, if you put on it, on the center line you see the particles. You see the top and the bottom and the charm and the electron and the muon. You see all the particles that we know, the quarks and the leptons. 
And they're all lumped together, although there are three or four or five uh, orders of magnitude among them. But on this huge scale, they're all somewhere in the middle. And then on the right, you see these arrows with the letter lambda, which is the new physics which may or may not exist and which can be as high as the Planck scale, which you see marked at the top or as low as about one or a few TeV, which is the CERN accelerator in a few years, or anywhere in between, and as you see, there are at least 15 orders of magnitude in between for the new physics to exist. And the CISO mechanism is connecting this new physics, which we don't know about, with the neutrino masses, which you will now see on the left. You can have this diagonal line, the diagonal line roughly, as a very crude measure, connects the normal particle masses in the middle, the new physics on the right, and the neutrinos on the left. And again, the higher lambda will be, the lower should be the neutrino masses, and vice versa. Now, we already talked about the mixing of the quarks, and in the same way, there is the mixing of the neutrinos. There are three neutrinos. If they have mass, each one of them will have a different mass. So they are identified by their masses, and we will call them nu1, nu2, nu3. But there are also nu e, nu mu, nu tau, which are the neutrinos connected to the electron, to the muon, and to the tau. And we don't know that they are the same. In fact, they are probably different. And if they are different, there could be transitions between them, there could be mixing, and there could be oscillation. A neutrino which is generated in an accelerator could travel and become something else. A neutrino which is generated in a reactor could travel and become something else. And this is the only equation that you will see in this lecture. This is the probability of neutrino oscillation. And it looks like complicated, but First of all, the equation is only the top line. The bottom line is just a unit. And what it says is the following. The probability that one neutrino will become another neutrino is proportional, first of all, to sine squared 2 theta, where theta is the mixing angle between these two neutrinos. So that's a parameter, a fixed parameter of nature, which we do not know. And then it has another sine square of something depending on the distant of the experiment from the source, on the energy of the particle, and on the mass of the particle. Now, if you look at it for a moment, you will see the following. If you think about such a formula, you will see the following. If you start with a reactor, you always have an electron neutrino. If you start with an accelerator, you have pi mesons coming out, and you always have mu neutrinos to a very good approximation. If you start with the sun as the source of your neutrino, again, it is electron neutrinos. And likewise, if it is a supernova or anything of that sort. If it is cosmic rays, we will discuss a little later. Now, when you know which kind of neutrino you started with, there are two ways to search for the oscillations. One is you start with one kind of neutrino, and you search down the beam for another kind that was not there before. So this is called an appearance experiment. You go to an accelerator where you have new mu's, and you go and look for the experimental signature of a new E. That means that you started with one kind, and you have the other kind. The other possibility is you start with one kind, and you look for the same one, but you know with how many you started, and you look for them, and you try to see if you have the same number or a smaller number. And that's called a disappearance experiment, because if you see an effect, it's only the effect that some of them disappear. For instance, all the solar experiments are like this. You know how many electron neutrinos are coming out of the sun, or at least you think you know, you do an experiment to look for them, you see them, but you see only 60% of what came originally from the sun, or only 40% or only 80%. And 
and that's called a disappearance experiment. You have found oscillation, but you don't know to what it oscillated. You know that it could have only oscillated or transformed to another kind of neutrino, but you don't know to what kind. So again, in the appearance experiment, you are observing the oscillation of one type to another type, and you know which type to which type. In the disappearance, you observe that one started and some of it disappeared, but you don't know to which type. You can only suspect or guess or use auxiliary arguments. So these neutrinos, they have a real identity crisis. You have a large family of experiments, astrophysics with the sun or with supernova or with cosmic rays, land-based experiments like reactors and accelerators, and some of the experiments are appearance experiments, and some are disappearance. Now, let us look uh, for a moment at this formula that we looked at before. If you look at the formula, what you see is the following. Let me just go back. Okay. Now, we have three different mixings here. We have the mixing of the electron and the muon. We have the mixing of the mu and the tau, and we have the mixing of the e and the tau. So this can be referred to as the first and the second, theta one, two, the second and the third, and the first and the third. See angle just like in the quark sector. Now again, look at the equation on the yellow box. It's the same equation as before. And let us watch it for one second. Suppose that we are talking about an argument L over E times delta M square, or let's put it this way. Suppose delta M square is so small that the sine square of this whole big bracket is approximately zero. Then there will be no oscillation. So if the mass difference of the two neutrinos is nothing, First of all, if it's exactly nothing, there will definitely be an oscillation. And if it's very small, there will be tiny negligible oscillation. Now let's, let's go to the other extreme. Suppose that delta M is so large that this argument 1.27 L over E delta M squared is a huge number. So that means, essentially, that when you are looking at the oscillation, you will be averaging of over a rapidly changing sine wave, which means that basically it will average out to one half. The average of the sine square is of one half. And you will end up with an oscillation probability of one half sine square two theta. That's an excellent way to measure theta, but it teaches you nothing about the masses. But if delta M squared, the masses of the particles, is of the same order of magnitude as L over E, namely the argument is of order 1, then you will be able to see real oscillation. Then you are in the correct distance and the correct energy and the correct mass range so that you can see particles changing into each other. And that's where you can really catch the information about the masses. So if you want to probe the masses of the neutrinos, the direct way we already said is not good enough. So the only other way is the oscillations. And the oscillation require that you will have a distance and an energy and a mass which are such that the argument of this sign in the yellow box will be of order one or half or a tenth or 10 or five, but not a million and not a million. And this is the only way to probe uh, delta M. Typically, for instance, if you do an experiment with an accelerator, which has energy of GeV, and the experiment is done one kilometer from the accelerator, you will be able to probe, typically, energies of masses of electron volt. If you do an experiment in a reactor with an energy of MeV and a distance of one meter also, the same, because one meter divided by MeV and one kilometer divided by GeV is the same ratio. If you want to go well below an electron volt, what you have to do is either go to much larger distances or 
uncomfortably go to much lower energies, and therefore you have to go to large distances. The typical graph that you get if you do such an experiment and, get, and see nothing is an exclusion graph. You see the graph in the bottom left. Let us say that you have done an experiment, doesn't matter if it's accelerator or reactor or whatever, and the result was nothing, which is a typical result of almost all of this experiment. What it, what it means is the following. For very, very low masses, you learn nothing. Because for very, very low masses, there would not be oscillations anyway. For very, very high masses, you learn only something about the angle, as we said before from the formula. And only for the masses in the range which is comparable to this L over E, you can learn information which is exemplified by the wavy line in the graph. So if you see nothing, you always exclude a certain region on a graph which has on one axis the mass of the neutrino and on the other axis the mixing angle. And basically all the experiments that are being done, either if they are appearance experiments, which electron converts to muon or whatever, or they are disappearance experiments, always would give you such pictures if you see nothing. If you see something, you will get co more complicated pictures that will show you the result. There are no experiments of oscillation that have been observed so far with tau neutrinos. I want to skip that now and get now to the result. Now, the story of the solar neutrino is well known. The sun emits 10 to the 38 neutrinos per second, of which 10 to the 29 go to the direction of the Earth. And you, if you have a detector of 100 ton, you have 40 hits per month out of these numbers. And it was a theoretical calculation of John Bacall on the left and the experimental miracle of Ray Davis on the right, which in the 60s led to the first experiment, the famous Homestake mine experiment on chlorine, where they had 400 tons of this famous cleaning fluid. And the results of this experiment, after running for 20 years, were this is a disappearance experiment. They have seen less than originally found. And the results are shown by this graph. And the allowed region is the region between the inner triangle and the outer triangle. You see here on the left the mass of the neutrino, delta m square, and at the bottom the mixing angle, and this is what was allowed. Then came the Japanese in Kamyokande with Toshi Koshiba as the leader of the original experiment, and later Super Kamyokande. They have done a marvelous job which eventually led to 50,000 tons of water, and here is the results that they had. Now, these results don't mean anything to you, and it didn't mean much to the world at that time, but if you combine the two results of the Davis experiment and Kamyokande, you already begin to see that the world is interesting. This orange area is the only area allowed by both different experiments. So you are already much more limited. And then came a first-class experiment done by a German, French, Italian, American, Israeli collaboration with uh, Israel Dostrovsky from the Weizmann Institute as one of the leaders of the experiment. And this was Galex, the, the, the real uh, leading forces were the Heidelberg groups uh, led by Kirsten and, and of course the Italians were in Gran Sasso where this was done with 30 ton of gallium. And this was the result for their experiment, which again looked to you like more or less the same as before. But now when you put everything on top of everything, you have this very dark area is the only area allowed by the three experiment. And now to remove the confusion, we'll, we remain just with that. So suddenly, everything is narrowed down now to two possibilities. Either we have a small angle, this is the left uh, area, a small angle, or we have a large angle with sine squared 2 theta close to 1. So the mixing angle is either small, like in the quark sector, or 
almost as large as it can be, unlike the quark sector. And the mass is somewhere, this is the mass squared, is somewhere between 10 to the minus 6 and 10 to the minus 4. In other words, it is a mass between 1, the mass itself, between 1 and 10 milli electron volts. So what is it? This is an electron neutrino coming from the sun, converting to another neutrino, and we are discovering that the mass of the other neutrino is somewhere between 1 and 10 milli electron volt. And that neutrino is mixed with the electron neutrino either by a small angle, the left solution, or by a large angle, the right solution. That's where we were after that. And then came the Canadian snow experiment where they used a thousand ton of heavy water, which has fantastic advantages. And this is where we were, we were before. And this is where snow led us. The snow experiment in Canada gave us these two options. And when you look at these two options together with the previous two options and combine everything, you remain just with this which means the victory of the large angle solution and the mass is now pretty determined to be somewhere like about 8 milli electron volt. Now this is quite a shock because the large angle solution means that the neutrinos which are the mass eigenstates are not at all close and not at all similar to the neutrinos which are the companions of the electron and the companions of the muon. Unlike the quark sectors where the, where the mixing angles are very tiny, here the mixing angles are much larger. And we therefore learn from this totality of the experiments that the solar model is right, namely everything that John Bacall and others have taught us about the sun is correct because the number of neutrinos coming out of the sun is now measured by the Canadians to be correct. We learned that the neutrinos oscillate. We learned that the neutrinos definitely have mass because they could not oscillate if they did not have mass. And we learned that one neutrino, probably mu neutrino, has a mass of approximately 8 milli electron volt and is mixed with the other neutrino with a very large mixing angle which is a big surprise. This was confirmed by an incredible experiment that the Japanese have done, where they look at the Kamiokande mine with the 50,000 ton of water under the ground, and they say, now let us look not at the neutrino from the sun, but they have four reactors with a typical distance of about 200 kilometers in four different directions around that mine. So they were basically doing a reactor experiment at a distance of 200 kilometers from an existing facility. And for the first time, they were doing a order 100 kilometer, but order 1 MeV experiment, which is the only way to probe very small masses. And this is what they found on the same plot. Any one of these three closed area plus the open area at the top is allowed. And lo and behold, here is the results, the combined result of all the previous experiment. So there is perfect consistency of all of this experiment. Let's look at it again. There is one tiny area of about 60, m squared equal to 60, and therefore m equal to 8 milli electron volt and the angle almost as large as it can be sine squared two theta almost one an entirely different direction and with that i conclude was cosmic rays cosmic rays we have protons coming out coming into the atmosphere hitting something becoming typically pions pions decay into muons muons decay into electron when the pion decays into a muon, a mu neutrino is emitted. When the muon decays into an electron, a mu neutrino and electron neutrino is emitted. So every time this happens, we have a total of two mu neutrinos and one electron neutrino. And therefore, we know that from cosmic rays, typically, the number of mu neutrinos should be twice the number of electron neutrino, as written on the left of the slide.
the number of new mu divided by number of new E is 2. Experimentally, what Kamiokande has found is that the ratio is not 2, but 1.2, which means that it is 60% of the original ratio, which means that some of the mu neutrinos are disappearing, and they could only become tau neutrino. There's nothing else they could become unless there's some other exotic types of neutrino we never heard of. And from those results, they could deduce the mass of the tau neutrino, which seems to be 50 milli electron volt. So we now have the masses of two of the neutrinos. The tau neutrino is around 50 milli electron volts, and the mu neutrino is around 8 milli electron volt, and both of them are very light. So here is now the summary of the world, so to speak, with the neutrinos. On the left is what we already heard in hints from Gabriele Veneziano earlier, and I'm sure you will hear much more in the next couple of days. Our picture of the universe today is between 65 and 70 percent dark energy, 25 to 30 percent dark matter, about 4 percent helium and hydrogen, about half percent heavy nuclei, and the total contribution of all the neutrinos to the energy of the universe is about half a percent, which is considerable because it's equal to all the heavy nuclei. The masses of the neutrino seems to be 50 milli electron volt, 8 milli electron volt, and unknown number which is much smaller. All three numbers are smaller by six, seven orders of magnitude than the lightest other particle that we know, namely the electron. All of these things are totally incomprehensible and unexplained. And the angles, the two angles that are known, the mixing between the first and the second, and the mixing between the second and the third seems to be very large, unlike the quark sector, and we don't understand why. There was also the famous supernova in 1987, which was the beginning of another kind of neutrino astronomy. There, 10 to the 57 neutrinos were emitted, 10 to the 28 reached Earth, 10 to the 17 reached the detectors, 20 were detected. That's neutrino physics for you. Two different det detectors out of 10 to the 57. Incidentally, I always like to make this comparison. The total number, if you estimate the total number of words that all human beings spoke since the beginning of the universe, it is of the order of 10 to the 17, 18, 19, that kind of order of magnitude, just so that you get an idea what 10 to the 57 means. So here's the last slide and where we are. We have additional angles to deal with neutrinos that I didn't mention. From the decay of the Z boson to neutrino, we know that there are only three kinds of neutrino and not more. New E, new mu, new tau, and that's it. We don't have another one of that category or of that ty type of properties. Neutrinos play an important role in primordial nuclear synthesis in the first few minutes of the universe, and that also gives an upper limit on the number of neutrino species, and that number is also three. So it even further strengthens our belief that three and not more. There's a whole area of neutrino-less double beta decay experiments, which can give extra information, but so far did not really illuminate us in a big way. There are more experiments uh, planned. There's a whole issue whether neutrinos can decay, because if they all have masses and they mix, they can also decay to each other. For instance, new tau can decay to mu, new mu plus a gamma ray. But when you calculate this type of decay, you find that their lifetime is longer than the age of the universe, which does not mean that they cannot happen, of course, given the huge number of neutrinos, but it does mean that it's practically impossible to think about detecting them. But there are certain theoretical issues which are affected by this possibility. Likewise, neutrino could have very tiny magnetic moments, which could lead to interesting effects, and there is CP violation, which is related to this. There may be heavy, very heavy neutrinos, which we don't know about, and there may be sterile neutrino neutrinos which don't interact with anything, which could spoil all kinds of theoretical arguments. There are zillions of papers written about every one of these issues, but I'm not getting. This is like the catalog of what we are not discussing. And then for the future, 
The most important thing in this respect is to measure precisely the masses and the angles. We are almost done. We have two of the three neutrino masses. We would like them more precise. We have two of the neutrino angles. We need the third one. There are big experiments planned to measure the third one, reactor experiments. These are extremely important clues for any new theory beyond the standard model. And when on the 80th anniversary of string theory, finally, there will be an experimental prediction, it should include these numbers. Neutrino astronomy is a new science which is only beginning. And we are talking about solar neutrino astronomy, supernova neutrino astronomy, high energy cosmic ray neutrinos, and ordinary cos cosmic ray neutrino astronomy. And of course, neutrinos may or may not have some relevance to some aspects of dark matter, but we are not getting into this. So you see that this, this enormous investments in brilliance and ingenuity and money and time has led almost always to either zero results or very meager, tiny numbers of events out of huge numbers of particles. And yet, see how much we have learned, starting from the beginning of the concept, what an important role the neutrino is playing in the creation of the world, the heavy element, ourselves, what an important clue it gives us for any theory that will go beyond the standard model, which is obviously our dream. And that's why I find it very exciting and very much the, the complementary story to the profound and brilliant theoretical work which are trying finally to understand what is behind all of this that we believe in. In, in the standard model and in the fundamental world of these particles. Thank you. Uh, we thank Chaim for uh, his talk and for opening us and reminding us of the world of the neutrinos and for challenging string theory. And uh, now for questions. <laughs> Gabriele. <laughs> the, the microphone. <laughs> Giving you the three months. No, it's not yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's not yet the ATS birthday. No, I, uh, it seems that uh, you're talking about neutrino masses, but there's, of course, in the oscillation formula, many mass differences appear. So you seem to have taken for granted the uh, so called hierarchical point of view, and given the the vague, the quote unquote, limits on the direct mass determination. Uh, how do you know that we will really get the three masses to high precision? Well, uh, first of all, the only way to answer such a question, which, which is a excellent, truly excellent question, is to say that in such a bird's eye review, you always have to omit all kinds of possibilities when you are discussing. And, and I apologize, but otherwise the talk would take 10 hours and not one. But to the point, yes, I'm assuming, and I neglected to say it, but I also neglected some other assumptions to state clearly, that like in the quarks and in the charged leptons, there is a clear hierarchy in the masses of neutrinos. At least they are not close to each other. Now, first of all, it's a guess, but to say the truth, the fact, I mean, there are some old hands in this game of connecting masses to angles, and Harold Fritsch is sitting here, who, who is uh, one of, of the old masters of this, and I played this game many years ago. Some of us believe that the smallness of the angles is related to the big ratios of the masses. Now, in the neutrino, suddenly we see, totally unexplained, that the angles are very large. So that could even be interpreted in your direction against what I'm saying, that the masses are close to each other. On the other hand, uh, it even raises the, the horrible possibility that the masses are much larger and almost precisely the same, differing by... Now, again, 
the reason I was assuming it, and most people assume it, is simply because uh, for, for the three neutrinos to have a large mass, and the three masses differing from each other by 10 to the minus 6 effect, there has to be a profound reason for it, and we don't have one. But, okay, it could, it could happen. It could happen. In, in the 100th birthday, we'll have an answer. No, no, in the 80th birthday. In the 80th birthday. <laughs> hey, Yuval. Anything you can say about my energy? Well... In the existence of... My Orana neutrinos must exist if you believe, I mean, if neutrinos have masses, as was demonstrated experimentally by the oscillation, and if the fact that the masses are so much smaller than the electron mass is due to this seesaw mechanism, that means that there is a Majorana mass and a Dirac mass to each of the neutrinos, and that the masses are nothing but the result of the two by two matrix of the Dirac element and the Majorana element. And therefore, in that sense, all the neutrinos are also Majorana neutrinos, but they are not pure Majorana neutrinos. The Majorana neutrino was supposed to be a massless neutrino, which is the antiparticle of itself. This is not massless. It is the antiparticle of itself, but it's, it has two sources of masses. And it has two sources of masses, and nobody else has two sources of, two sources of masses, because it's the only neutral particle in the world which is also the reason why it's the only particle that could be Majorana particle. So that's the way we look at it, but, yeah. Uh, then the, what was the conclusion about the neutrino and the atom neutrino? Are they different, are they the same, what do we know about they're them? They are, not, they are not the same and they are not different. They are two particles which, well, there are two states which, can mix with each other, therefore there is no quantum number that forbids them from mixing with each other. But they're separate. Uh, they're two, they're, they're sep two, dif two different states, definitely. But the states which, again, it's a matter because of the mixing, the particle that you would call neutrino and the particle that you call anti-neutrino, which appear, let's say, in beta decay of P2n and beta decay of N2p, is not precisely the mass eigenstate because the mass eigenstate is a mixture of these two particles. So every, every mass eigenstate in this game is a mixture of all the different species, including the three neutrinos and the three antineutrinos. And the mass is after the mass eigenstate. And the mass is you put A and B. Yeah, the yeah, sure. Any other questions? Yes, so. Thank you. When you get to these mass spectrum of the neutrinos, I could easily have a theory in which I make a Majorana term for all the neutrinos, which are the same. It is, it's a symmetry. And then the difference, mass difference are generated by small Dirac terms. And that would speak in favor of a nearly degenerate situation. I find this not so bad. I, uh, I would. I, I. I don't think we should really get into all the different models, which, which are possible. Yes, Harold, you're absolutely right. There are also models that, as you know very well, that people added by having a sterile neutrino and doing other games. Uh, but we, we we don't have a real convincing story yet coming out of it. Michal. Michal. In the quark sector, we have very precise information about mixing angle, and we think what the quark masses are, or the way they run from some point to another. What would be the best situation in neutrino masses? How exact can we eventually determine, even assuming that one neutrino masses, the other two neutrinos and the mixing angle? What's the level of precision you have? Uh, it's very hard. That's the clue. I mean, yeah. I, uh, not only that, we also we did not touch even the, also the phases. There's also CP violation, as you know <coughs> very well, and and that that's another whole set of parameters. And there's more than one phase in the neutrino sector, of course. Uh, I don't know how to answer this. I mean, in the next five years, I don't expect much improvement. The only thing that may happen in the next five or ten years 
of any significance would be a measurement or an improvement on the limit on the third angle, <coughs> theta 1, 3. And uh, all the others may improve a little bit, but I don't know if instead of saying it's approximately 8 milli electron volt, which really means probably 8 plus or minus 2 now or something like that, we will know that it's 8 plus or minus a half. I don't know that we are any wiser with this. But uh, I don't know. I, it's, it's not a measure of experimental precision only. It's a combination of the experimental precision and the errors. For instance, all, all the numbers that I was showing were derived by overlapping the results of different experiments. Now, that already combines the experimental errors of several different experiments, which is always dangerous. But beyond that, every one of these limits includes the solar model. Now, the solar model is incredibly successful. But to tell you that anybody knows that it is accurate to 3% or 1% or 0.1% would be really an exaggeration. And that's also a source of error. So I, I just don't know the answer to this. Okay. I, I'm not sure anybody knows, but certainly I don't know. The last question, Zvi. Uh, how does the experimental situation now support this in particular? Are there any experiments like LS and D that you have to assume are wrong in order to fit the data? To fit the data? Uh, that's the only one, but I'm, I'm, I'm not 100% sure what's the situation on this. I mean, I know that most people don't believe it, but I don't know if anybody has pointed out something which is wrong with it. But that's to, to you said it right, that's the only experiment which may claim a contradiction to this picture. Okay, so with this conclude this session we would like to send the speaker again